Hi Year 8, um, you might be looking at the lesson, the title of this lesson and it being called Lesson Zero, I think that's a bit odd, um, but this is things from the Year 7 genes topic that really you have to feel quite confident about before we can move on to Year 8, so since it comes before Year 8 genes is starting, I thought I'd call it Lesson Zero, um, and as its title says here, it's about what do you remember from Year 7? Um, so you, what I'd like by the, by the end of this video lesson is for you to feel confident about the word chromosome, um, the word variation, and the word inheritance, because all three of those, um, particularly the last two, are very important for the Year 8 genes topic. Um, I want you to be able to describe how DNA is organised in a cell, where it's found, what it's organised into, um, and also how mutations can happen. When cells are dividing, you need to know what a mutation is and what it can lead to. Um, lastly, and these will both again be helpful for the year eight genes topic, I'd like you to be able to explain how characteristics are inherited. Characteristics being things like, well, let's say in humans, that could be hair colour, eye colour, things like that. And also how our DNA is structured, what the structure of a piece of DNA actually is. So let's start with DNA and chromosomes. And in the background here um, on this slide, you should be able to see the um, typical structure of what we think of when we talk about chromosomes, these X-shaped objects. So chromosomes are found in the nucleus of every plant and animal cell. Um, chromosomes are complex molecules of DNA, meaning they're not just small pieces um, of DNA, they contain massive pieces of DNA, huge great long structures of DNA, all folded in on themselves um, and wrapped up or coiled into these much denser structures called chromosomes. And um, DNA contains all of the information we need to be able to make more cells. They are the instructions to make the cells that make us up, to make the chemicals that make us up. Um, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, but that's a very complex and long name. If you just call it DNA and you can describe what it is, that will be perfect. Now, most cells in humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes all together, um, which 23 pairs means you have 46 chromosomes in each cell. Um, of those 23, sorry, of those 46 chromosomes, 23 come from your mum and 23 come from your dad. And they pair up one from your mum and one from your dad to make those 23 pairs. Now, I said that a chromosome is made from a very, very long piece of DNA. Yeah, and it really is incredibly long. But a smaller piece of DNA is called a gene. If we look at a small section of DNA, um, we have this structure called a gene. Um, because it's only a small section of DNA that makes up a gene, and a chromosome is a very, very long piece of DNA, each chromosome has hundreds or maybe thousands of genes on it. And what that means is that in total, each of us has around somewhere around 20,000 genes. And each gene um, is a set of instructions to control something um, about us, some particular characteristic. So if you have blonde hair, then you definitely have some genes for blonde hair. However, it's also likely you have some genes for other colours of hair too, but they're just not showing up in you. Um, genes control all other things too, like whether or not you have dimples, how likely you are to have freckles, and things like that. One of the things that a particular pair of chromosomes controls is what sex you are. And I'd like you to have a go at answering this question. Which pair of chromosomes is it that actually determines the sex of a person? 
And I've got a picture of the chromosomes in question here, or at least one version of them anyway, because there are multiple different versions. And um, to help you answer this question, I'm going to include um, this link in the description box below this video. Um, if for any reason you can't find it, if you pause the video here, you could type it in on your web browser and it will take you straight to it. But please pause here, go to that link and then have a go at answering this question for me. So if you've got to this point, you should have had a go at answering the question already. Um, because the pair that controls sex in humans, we actually have them all numbered and it's pair 23, the very last pair. And they carry genes which determine an embryo sex, whether the offspring is going to be male or female. Um, if the um, embryo is eventually going to become male, then they will have two um, sex chromosomes in pair 23 that look different to each other. So they're highlighted in blue at the bottom here. You can see one slightly larger one, which is called an X chromosome, and then a shorter one or smaller one, which is called a Y chromosome. Females have a different pairing. They have two X chromosomes instead. So they have two of the larger chromosome. So we are all here because a sperm and an egg met. They fused or joined together. The nucleus of the sperm cell, which had 23 chromosomes in it, and the nucleus of the egg cell, which had 23 chromosomes in it, have joined or fused together to produce one cell called a zygote, which is just the fancy name for a fertilized egg cell. And that fertilized egg cell or zygote contains 46 chromosomes, but it is just one cell. We, we all started our lives as one single cell. And now we're made up of trillions of cells. For that to happen, we have to go through a process of cell division, which I've shown in the background on this slide here. It literally just means the cell dividing from one cell and eventually to make two identical cells. And cells divide for two main reasons. Um, one is for growth, which is very important when we are very young and is still really important for all of you lot too. But the other role that cell division plays is to help with repairing things in our body. And this is important for everybody, whether you're still growing or whether you stopped growing a long time ago. When a cell divides, so when it goes from one cell and splits into two, the genetic information or DNA that is stored in the genes is copied. So inside the nucleus of each cell, we have the chromosomes, as we mentioned earlier, big long structure, the structure is made of a very long strand of DNA. And each chromosome contains lots and lots of genes. Since those genes are going to decide lots of characteristics for the the person who these cells are a part of, the genes must be copied over perfectly into our new cell. So when the cell divides, the DNA stored in the genes needs to be copied so that each new cell is a perfect copy of the original cell. However, this does not always happen. If that did always happen, we'd all look very, very similar. We'd, in fact, we'd all look identical. Um, however, sometimes an error occurs when the DNA is being copied or the genetic information is being copied. And if an error is made and the DNA is not copied perfectly, we call that a mutation. Now, not all mutations are harmful. The fact that there are different hair colours in humans, that's due to mutations. The fact that there are different eye colours is due to mutations. We often think of mutations as being a very harmful thing, but it's not always true. Now, changes in genes um, are always due to mistakes, but those mistakes can be made more common by certain factors in your environment. If you're exposed to a group of chemicals that are called mutagens, M-U-T-A-G-E-N, then the likelihood of mutations developing in your cells becomes much more common. Now, 
If a change occurs in your genes due to the environment, they'll affect you. However, you will only pass those mutations on if they affect your sperm cells if you're male or your egg cells if you are female. And next then, I'd like you to have a go at these two questions. So please pause here and try these two now. So if you're at this point in the video, you should already have tried these two questions. If you haven't, pause and try, try them now, please. But for those of you who already have, let's go through our answers. So what are the two reasons that cells divide? Growth, allowing you to grow, and repair, letting your body fix things, organs, cells, etc. Um, that needs to be repaired. What is a mutation? So when cells are dividing, all their DNA needs to be copied to make sure that the cell that's being produced is an identical copy of the cell that we're trying to create a copy of. But sometimes a mistake is made when we copy the DNA. And this is an example of a mutation. So in the background on this slide, you, I'm hoping that you can guess what, what this is that's occurring here. I mentioned earlier we all started out as what is called a zygote or a fertilised egg cell. And a fertilised egg cell is produced when a sperm, which is the sort of tadpole looking thing on the background of this slide with the tail, joins with an egg cell, which is the much larger structure that the sperm is burrowing its way into. So when the sperm cell from the male joins or fuses with the egg cell from a female, it's called fertilization. Now, sperm and egg cells are examples of specialized cells. They are cells that have very particular jobs um, and are adapted to be really good at those jobs. Now, they have lots of different um, specializations or adaptations. For example, the sperm has a tail. It has a tapered head that comes to a point, so it's a little bit more streamlined or aerodynamic. Um, the egg cell has a jelly coat around the outside that only lets one sperm cell through and then hardens so no others can get through. And it has a big store of food to support the zygote. But one way that they are both specialised is something we mentioned already, that instead of having the full 46 chromosomes, they only have 23. Half of the genetic information or half of the DNA in the fertilised egg comes from the sperm cell and half comes from the egg cell. And this makes up 46 chromosomes in total. If the sperm and the egg both had a full set of DNA, the fertilised egg cell, or the zygote, would end up with far too much. Now, this is an example of sexual reproduction, when sex cells from a male and a female of a species are needed um, in order to produce offspring. And one of the useful things about sexual reproduction is that it leads to a lot of variation. And that was a term that we mentioned at the very, very start of the video. Variation just means differences between organisms or living things from the same species. So if we were in, if you were in your science class now, you'd be able to look around and see lots of variation. You would see different hair colours. You would see different eye colours. You would see different earlobe types. Everybody thinks that their earlobes are the same earlobes that everybody else has. But if you compare with, with other people, you will see some people's earlobes are attached all the way down at the bottom end of their ear. Whereas other people's, like mine, have a bit that hangs down a little bit and then loops back up to the side of your head. Now, the reason we get variation or differences in offspring um, is because the, the DNA of two different people, the parents, are being combined to provide the DNA for the offspring. Now, th this means that you get a mixture of characteristics or features 
from your mum and dad. And you may already be able to tell some of the features that you've got from each parent. Now, as we mentioned previously, the environment can also affect variation in a species as well. Um, and by the environment, we mean things like diet and lifestyle. So, for example, if you spend a lot of time in the sun, um, or if you spend a lot of time in the sun where there's a lot of intense sunlight, your skin will naturally darken and your hair will likely become a slightly lighter colour. And um, this would be an example of the environment causing variation in you. It's nothing to do with your genetics. It's all your environment having an effect. And variation can be split into two big groups. It can be continuous, which means things like height, for example. If we are measuring somebody's height, so if we take your science class and we measure everybody's height, we would have a minimum, which would be the smallest person, and we would have a maximum, which would be the tallest person. But between that minimum and maximum, you could have any height value at all. So when we have continuous variation, um, even though we have a minimum and a maximum value allowed, all the other measurements can be anything between that minimum and maximum. The other type of variation is discontinuous variation. Now, discontinuous variation refers to things that can only get um, a thing that we can measure about you or a characteristic of yours or a feature of yours where you can't have any value like you can for continuous. Instead, you're going to fit in a particular group. And a good example of this would be your blood type. There are only certain blood types. So instead of just looking at your class, we could look at the whole of year eight. And if we found out everybody's blood type, people would only fit into a small number of groups and you would only belong to one of them. So again, I would like you to pause here and have a go at these two questions. And um, you may need to do a little bit of research for these. So if that's necessary, that's fine. But make sure you've paused and had a go at them, please. So if you're at this point in the video, you should already have answered these two questions. If you haven't, please pause and do so. But for the rest of us, let us go through these answers. So explain the difference between continuous and discontinuous variation and give two examples of each. Well, continuous variation is something that we measure that can have any value between a, a minimum and a maximum. So the two examples I've gone for here are height and how long your foot is. Discontinuous variation, however, is something that we can measure about you, a feature or a characteristic where you go into a particular group, into a defined group. And um, for example, eye color, if we were measuring everyone's eye color, you would either be in blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, hazel eyes, and that's probably going to be all of the groups that you could belong to. We might have a bit of an argument over which group you belong in, but you definitely belong to one of them. And the other one, um, or the other good example, is blood type. Question two. Humans reproduce by sexual reproduction, which involves the sex cells. These sex cells, sperms and egg cells, only contain 23 chromosomes. Why is this important? Well, most human cells have 46 chromosomes organized into 23 pairs. And during fertilization, when the egg and the sperm cell join together, the nuclei, which is the plural of nucleus, of the egg and the sperm cell combine. And the chromosomes from the egg and the sperm match up. This causes variation. Um, if the egg and the sperm cell had 46 chromosomes each, the fertilized egg or zygote would end up with 92 chromosomes, which is far too many. So we mentioned variation, which is this idea of differences within a species. 
And the type of variation that people often think of is inherited variation. The, th the information that is written into your genes or written into your DNA that causes differences between us and other members of our species. The reason we call it inherited variation is it is passed on from one generation to the next. Your DNA came from your parents. In the future, you may pass on your DNA to your children. Any little unusual quirks in your DNA that cause particular characteristics or features in you could be passed on to your children in the same way that you may have inherited um, unusual characteristics from your parents. Um, DNA, which is the image you can see in the background on this slide and has this strange twisted ladder-like structure, which is called a double helix, is made from two strands that have been bonded together in this double helix shape. Um, it, it really does to me look like someone has held the top of a ladder and the bottom of a ladder and twisted it. The strands are made up of long chains of chemicals called bases. And there's only four bases. They're called guanine, cytosine, thymine and adenine. But if you're already thinking there's no way I can remember those names, they usually just go by their first letter. So we normally call these four bases G, C, T and A. And again, you might be looking at this list and thinking, why didn't he just put them in alphabetical order? The reason is that that is not the way they join together. So when these chemicals um, are making up a, a long piece of DNA, in what looks a bit like the rungs of a ladder, um, two of these chemicals are joined together to hold the two strands of DNA together. Um, guanine, or G, always joins with cytosine, which is C, and thymine, T, and adenine, A, always join together as well. G and A don't fit together, G and T don't fit together, C doesn't fit with T, C can't fit with A, and they can only join with their allotted partner. It's what's called a complementary base pair. Um, this structure was eventually worked out by two scientists, James Watson and Francis Crick, um, in 1950. Um, doing so, they used an X-ray image of the structure of DNA um, called Photo 51 that was produced by Rosalind Franklin. Um, another scientist called Maurice Wilkins also produced work which helped support um, the model that Watson and Crick came up with. For their, their work, Watson, Crick and Wilkins were all awarded the Nobel Prize for Science, um, but unfortunately Rosalind Franklin died before the, the prize was awarded. And um, Next then I'd like you to all pause and have a go at this top question please. The bit further down the page is an optional extra task that if you have some extra time or you're interested in the work of Rosalind Franklin and what she did, um, you could complete um, and send evidence of to your science teacher. This would not only be worth lots of extra class charts points, um, but it would help improve your, your knowledge on the history of science and the really important work that Rosalind Franklin did in discovering the structure of DNA. So everyone needs to try the top one but this second one is an optional extra. So our question was, DNA is the genetic material of human cells. Describe the structure of DNA and where it's found. So let's start with its structure. DNA is made up of those four chemicals called bases. And if you called them just A, T, C, and G, that's absolutely fine. But I've included their proper names too, adenine and thymine, guanine and cytosine, the bases are joined together in two big long strands, which wrap around each other in a structure called a double helix, which is like a twisted ladder shape. 
The bases join in complementary pairs, meaning they can only fit with certain things. They are very specific and very particular. A will only join with T and C will only join with G. Um, and this diagram on the right is actually quite useful because it gives you an idea about why and it's to do with their shape. It's not that G doesn't like A. It's just that they're the wrong shape and they can't fit together. And I've just realised I've forgotten to include the very last bit. Where is it found in a human cell? The DNA is found in the nucleus organised into chromosomes. Very last thing for you to do today then is to try these two exam questions. There's one on this slide and there's one on the next slide. So please pause here and have a go at answering this question about identical twins and inheritance and variation um, with their parents. If you're on this slide, you should already have completed the first one, first exam question. Um, but if you have done so, pause here and answer this one for me. And then we'll quickly run through our answers. So 1A, um, if you have answered genes or DNA or chromosomes, that gets you one mark. And if you've said in the sex cells or the eggs and sperm or the, proper, the, the name for the both of them, which is the gametes, or even saying at fertilization, you could have a mark as well. Um, part two, they have genes or DNA or chromosomes from both parents. Or you could say they've got genetic information from both parents. That would be fine too. And even saying from eggs and sperm or from egg and sperm would be fine. Question B, they have the same genetic information or they have the same genes or they have the same DNA or the same chromosomes. If you've said that they come from the same egg and the same sperm or from the same fertilized egg or zygote, that would be fine. Just saying from the same egg would not be enough. And just saying from the same sperm is not enough. If you're going to mention egg and sperm, you must mention both of them. And then lastly, question C. Um, either one of these would be fine. Eye colour is inherited or it is controlled by your DNA or genes. Eye colour is not affected by the environment. And that's everything for today.